You'll be so excited to know that we're going to talk about the Doctrine of Eyes for the sixth time. This will probably be the last time for a while. This work says that we need to try to live more consciously toward ourselves and others. Why should we try to live more consciously towards ourselves and others? Really no reason. There's no reason why anyone should try to live more consciously toward themselves or toward others, especially if ignorance is bliss. If ignorance is bliss, then we should try to be more ignorant. That was another thing I forgot about meditation. Some people meditate for bliss, just to have this wonderful feeling. They aren't going to really enjoy Anapana and Vipassana that much <laughs> because there's not a lot of bliss involved in it because you're observing things in yourself and the things that are in yourself that you have to observe are not very pleasant things. There's not a lot of bliss involved with finding out who you really are. You start to find out who you really are, how many different eyes are inside of you, how many different wills, how many conflicting ideas, how many conflicting beings live inside of you. Suddenly, it's not a very happy experience. The only happiness that can come from it, as far as I can tell at all, is the awareness that you know something now that you didn't know before, and you have a little bit more awareness about that and a little bit more control over your actual self, who you really are, who you actually are, what you're really doing, not what you imagine you're doing. We all imagine that we're wonderful people. We all imagine that everybody likes me. If they don't like me, they have a problem. We don't have any problems. They do. But if they don't like me, there's something wrong with them. What could be wrong with them? Well, they probably didn't get enough love as children. It's always them, never us. I didn't get enough love as a child. Did anybody? I, I, I don't know anybody got enough love as a child. Did anybody? Is there enough? Can you get enough? Maybe you can to live more consciously towards yourself and others. Begin by being conscious of the eyes, especially the negative eyes inside of you. What we want to do is start to become aware of the conflicting things inside, the conflicting eyes inside of us, the conflicting parts, facets of our personality inside of us. For example, it's a horrible example. I hate this example, but I'm going to do it anyway because I think it works. Schnicky, our obese orange cat. I was on the sofa the other day and I was playing this video game. And I was really getting my butt kicked in this video game. And I was totally identified with this video game. I didn't know that this character, this animated character on the screen was not me. I was just getting smeared, really angry. And Schnicky comes over and he jumps up on the couch and he comes over and he gets on my stomach and he starts doing that thing that cats do, kneading with their claws into the stomach. And it's like, ow! Plus, I'm already getting my butt kicked in this video game. So I just yelled at him. I mean, I really yelled, ah, 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 and pushed him away. And he took off. And I thought, ow, man, I didn't want to do that. And that was it right there. What I saw was this nasty eye that is not getting its way and something comes, anything, and it blames its woe and its lack of control and its inability to beat the game and its inability to tolerate anything in life that's not going its way. It pushes out of the way, it yells at it, goes off on. I looked at that and I went, ick, I don't like seeing that. Now, I could pretend it's not there like all the rest of you do, but then I wouldn't be here talking to you about this, and you wouldn't be there listening about this. We've got to stop pretending. We've got to stop pretending that we're this nice, I'm this nice guy. This is me. This picture here, see this nice picture, the graduation picture, the nice picture where I was young and happy and smiling. Those are the good pictures. Those are the pictures we like. Those are the pictures we bring out and show other people. These other ugly pictures of us being mean to the cat because we're not getting our own way. What's the cat got to do with it? The cat doesn't know anything. He just came for some love. What he gets met with is this insane maniac who's not getting his way and willing to take it out on any living thing anywhere in a 50-foot radius. Now, that's the truth about us. That's the truth about you. That's the truth about all of us. Those are the eyes that we need to become aware of. And can you see the resistance to becoming aware of them? Can you see the resistance to consciousness? No, no. I can't be that person. Well, you're not that person, but you're not the nice picture either. You're not any of those pictures. You don't know who you are. All those pictures were acquired in life by going through to every photo booth you ever saw. Click, 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 click. And the ones we liked, we kept, and the ones we didn't, we got rid of. And we always kept the ones that made us look good. So we had this collection, this album of pictures that make us look good. And then the ones that don't make us look good, well, that's not, that's not me, that's you. That's not a picture of me, that's a picture of my brother. No, that's not me. That's you. I mean, have you done that? Yes. Okay, good. So you know what I'm talking about. 
So we begin by being conscious of the eyes, especially the negative eyes. It's a great day when we see eyes inside of us wishing to behave, wishing to speak in a certain way. And the work has brought us to a point where we don't have to say what we could easily have said very mechanically. It's a great day when we come to the point when the cat jumps up in our lap and does the kneading thing, and all of a sudden the rage comes up. It's like, and we go, wait a second. And it's all there, but you don't have to do anything about it. That's a great day. Because the work has begun to work in you. Because consciousness has begun to do its work. Because light has begun to do its work. Light works, people. Look outside. See all that green stuff? That's light working. Yes, that's light working. Light is growing things. And those green things are what help keep us alive on this planet. Without those green things, you wouldn't have anything to breathe. Plants are inhaling what we exhale, and they're exhaling what we inhale. They are cleaning the air, recycling it for us. The sun is doing that. The sun, the light, is working. And it's working with the film of organic life on this planet. And it's working with it in such a way to keep us alive long enough to wake up. Because that's really our purpose here. We have two purposes. One purpose is life's purpose. Well, just be a part of organic life on this planet. Go out there and have kids and get married and do this and do that. The other possibility is the possibility to wake up and be what your potential is, what you could be, where you could just go the way of all life, go the way of all flesh, which is fine. That works too. Or if you happen to be one of the ones who looks at life and says, you know, I don't think I really want to go that way. I think there's more to life. If you happen to be one of those, then possibly this work is for you. It may not be. I don't know. This certainly is not for everybody. In fact, it seems to be for very few. Now, that's only because most people are still not awake enough to realize that there is a possibility for them that is beyond anything that this world offers. When we get to that point where we don't say what we could have easily said mechanically, it's a wonderful milestone. When you reach that milestone, it's like, yes, there are thousands more you've got to reach. But that doesn't matter. You've reached one and you know you're becoming more conscious, and that's a good thing. Though eyes are thinking in you, you have the power of not going with those thoughts because you have stronger work thoughts. This happens for me every day now. Every day. Eyes will be thinking in me, and they'll be thinking this, they'll be thinking that. They have their usual thought patterns. And I look at them and I go, yeah, uh-huh. So? And I don't have to go with them. I don't have to say, I think that. I don't have to keep company with them. Because I have a different group of eyes that are growing around this work. Those eyes are strong. They look at that and they go, no, no. They just say no to drugs. That's what they are. All these negative emotions are drugs for us. Just say no to drugs. And the eyes, the work eyes can help you do that. They can help you to say no to these things. If you think about our addictions, negative emotions are addictions for us. They're drugs. They are addictions. Just say no. But you can't say no unless you've got something stronger. And these work thoughts are stronger. Often, we're able to do this for a short time. But when more asleep, then those eyes end up having their way with that. Let's put it this way. Somebody says something to me. And it's one of those remarks, you know, where you just think, and you're ready, right back. you got a really good answer, but you don't. You don't have to go with that thought. You don't have to go with those eyes. You've got other stronger thoughts that say no, and so you don't. But then when you're not as awake and you're not as strong, your energy's down a little bit, you're not paying attention, you end up calling them up on the phone, chewing their head off, or you write them an email. And all the things that you weren't going to say, you now say. I can tell it happens because here you are smiling and nodding your head. So you've obviously seen this happen. So the very thing you decided not to do, you end up doing. So we can do it for a short time. Then they have their way with us. We do or say something stupid, adding to the chain of karmic cause and effect that we're carrying around inside of ourselves. And what does all this mean, really? What it really means is it's not as bad as it looks. Because you've separated from those eyes for a short time, it's really not as bad. Especially if while they're ranting, you dislike them. Even while I was being an idiot with the cat, I didn't like it. There was no justification for it. There was no sympathy for it. There was no excuse for it. There was nothing for it. It was just like, you jerk. That I, it was that behavior. It was just wrong. And the reason I'm telling you about it is because it was wrong. I have no excuse for it other than I'm a machine. I had a moment of lapse where I allowed myself to get totally identified with something else, and then some life interfered with my identification, and I got cranky, and the cat suffered. We've since made friends. I just wanted you to know that. We've since made friends. I tried to make it up to him, and he's still a little leery of me. Oh, he's a little volatile. I don't think I want to... And I don't blame him. He's right. While those eyes are ranting, you dislike them. You're conscious of them. Even when you're out of control, you still see them. 
And this is a step that you have not been able to make before this work. This is the whole point, introducing the slightest disbelief in these eyes. That's what we're after. If you can start to introduce some disbelief in them. No, I don't believe that that's a good way to go. I don't believe this lie. I don't believe this justification for it. I don't believe that there's any reason for it, any excuse for it. No, it's wrong. I don't want that behavior at all under any circumstances ever, period. There's no reason to justify it any longer. This is a big step, huge step. People don't understand how far they've come when they can do that. Because it's the beginning of separation from them. I can talk about this thing now instead of keep it in the dark. You know how we like to keep things like this? Because we all do things like this. And these are the big secrets we have in life. The time that somebody strangled the duck when they were a little kid. I hear things like this. Somebody who drowned kittens or hurt a puppy or strangled a duck or did something like that. And this is their big thing in life. They look back at that and they, they just cringe and they want to wipe it out of their minds. They don't want anything to do with it because they don't like to admit that there are eyes inside of them that are just flat-out cruel dictators who will do anything to get what they want. They don't like that. So they pretend that they're not there, and that gives them power, because what isn't there does hurt you. What you don't see does hurt you. What you don't know does hurt you. What you do know to be forewarned is to be forearmed. What you do know about, you can set traps for. You can slow down. You can block. What you don't know about blindsides you. You've got to pay enough effort to escape the eyes that wish to keep your life down at one small level. Man, it's effort. I got an email the other day from a woman who listens to the podcast. <laughs> Peter husband had been listening to the podcast and discussing them. And she says, you know, I used to think it was really cute that you keep calling this the work. She said, but man, it's really work. I've been working my butt off. I can't believe how much work this is. Now, I'm starting to understand what you're talking about. Yes, it is work. You have to make an enormous amount of effort. Nobody just wakes up. People don't just wake up accidentally. That's not what life does. Life isn't like that. If people woke up accidentally, you'd be walking into awake people all the time. You'd be bumping into all the people you know. You would know someone awake. You don't know anyone who's awake. You may know people who are a little more awake than you, but you don't really know anybody who's awake. If you think you do, you probably think it's you. <laughs> <laughs> that ought to give you a clue of just how crazy you are. What about this paying enough effort to escape the eyes that wish to keep your life down at one level? Perhaps you'll have to work on something different, like laziness, lack of concentration, not taking in new impressions, the lethargy that we get in life of not taking in new impressions. I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to do anything. Why? I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to be bothered with out there. But this work is in life. The fourth way is in life. You need to know as much about life as you can know about life. You need to take in as many different varied kinds of impressions as you can take in because that's potential food and fuel for this work. This work isn't supposed to be done in a monastery. That's the way the monk is done in a monastery. The fourth way, the way of the balanced man, is done in life. It's something that people like us can do in life. And we can make great progress in the fourth way because there is so much life to get involved in, and there's so many impressions to take in, you can have lots and lots and lots of fuel, lots and lots and lots of things to work with. Maybe you'll have to make small efforts, things that you've ignored to learn something you should know. You'll just have to make efforts for things that you ought to know. You ought to know about what? What should you know about? Maybe some things in life that the kids should know about. That things don't always go the, the way they need to, the way they want it to go. Yeah, yeah it's not yeah. always about them and what they want. Well, that's a little deeper than I was looking for. I like to balance a checkbook. A checkbook. Balance a checkbook. Pay good. Your tax. Pay your taxes. These are good things to know. They're good things to know. Well, why is that? Well, you'll find out. <laughs> you'll find out when you don't. You know, when you when you get your checkbook back and it's like checks start bouncing. You go, oh, what? I had more checks. I don't understand this. I have plenty of checks left. You got to put money in the bank. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, these are good things to know. These are things you ought to know. You ought to know about not speeding. You ought to know about running red lights. You ought to know about running stop signs. You ought to know about things like that. Things you ought to know about. So you need to learn about those things. You need to put forth some effort to learn about little things. Well, how is this going to help you to be more conscious? It helps. How it helps is because any time you add consciousness to your life, in any area, you have added consciousness to your life. You've added light to your life. You are more aware of something then that helps with being more aware of everything. Because this is all connected. It's all connected. Your psychology, who you are, isn't just one thing. It's a multifaceted thing. It's like a bowl of spaghetti. 
It's like a bowl of spaghetti. They're just all these different things, and they're all twisted around and turned around, and they each have two ends, and it goes here and there, and you're finding what is what, and they all look alike. And we're connected like that. Everything is connected to everything else. You pull one, and the next thing you know, you have a whole bunch of them. You stick your fork in, you think, I'm just going to get one. Have you tried to get one piece of spaghetti? Just one. It just doesn't work that way. A whole bunch of them come up. And then you try and get every one except the one off your fork, and then they all slide off. As you can tell, I've tried this. <laughs> I've tried this at home. <laughs> and I recommend also that you try it at home. Don't try it here. You've got to make these efforts about small things that you've ignored. Learn something that you don't know. Ospensky used to say, don't forget your umbrella. That's it. See, it's just a simple little thing. Well, don't forget your umbrella. Well, why? Well, because it'll rain and you'll get wet. And it's something you ought to know. That's all you ought to know not to sit in certain places. You ought to know not to go to certain places. You ought to know these things. How are you going to know if you don't learn them? There are things we need to put forth effort to learn. Maybe you'll have to make um, efforts that are bigger. Go back to school. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. You'll find what it is you have to do. The work will show you what areas that you're weak in that you need to strengthen yourself in and you need to be strengthened in and what areas that you're too strong in you need to pay attention to other areas. Make them more passive. Everything hangs together in our psychology and its makeup. Everything widens us, helps to generate more consciousness in ourselves, and it helps in all the work on ourselves. So if you work in just one small area, let's say we, we do something that's almost insignificant. For example, the cat. I mean, come on, this is not like a human being. This is a cat. Yeah, but everything connects to everything else. And if I can work this out with a cat or an animal, then the next step is to work it out with a person. And if I can work it out with a person, then I can work it out with a whole type of person. If I can work it out with a whole type of person, I may be able to work it out with different types of people. If I can work it out with different types of people, I may be able to work it out with all people. I may be able to get to the point where nothing bothers me like that. I may be able to get to the point where nothing moves me inside like that, where I am totally insulated from anything that happens out there, where people don't do what I want and I don't have to go crazy where I don't get what I want and I don't have to be upset. That could happen. That's the purpose of this work. That's what this work is about. To become a balanced man, one must first be a good householder. What's a good householder? Well, a good householder is somebody who can balance his checkbook, pay his bills, pay his taxes, go to work on time, do his job, not goof off, not get fired, make his boss happy, make the people he serves happy, make his family happy, as far as you can make anyone happy. Of course, you can't make anyone happy, and that's no excuse for not making people happy. A lot of us like to use that as an excuse. The work in all esoteric teaching says, work against ignorance in all forms. If we live in a few small parts of centers, the basis is all wrong. It's too narrow. It's hard to work. We've got to expand. One of the things that people have said about being here for so many years is that I'm always getting you into something new and exciting or new and not so exciting or <laughs> something different. And how many times I've gotten you into things and it's like, and it's always expansive and you never know what it's going to be. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> and now what will it be? But you know, the thing is, if you think about it, it has enriched your life. It has broadened your life in so many ways. I mean, how many people do you know who've ridden 100 miles on a bicycle? How many people do you know who bicycle toured Portugal, Africa, and Spain? Not a lot of people. Well, we know two of them right here in this room because we did it together. It was a tough experience, but we did it. And then there were a lot of us who did the 100-mile thing. It wasn't it 100 miles? We rode 100 miles on a bicycle one day. That's tough stuff, but it brings you up against things you could never come up against in ordinary life. And you reach down and you find things inside of yourself that you never knew were there. Would you agree? That's good. It's good to agree, especially if it's right. Ospensky said, what's the good of trying to study special knowledge of the work when you have no ordinary knowledge can be got from life? This is why this work doesn't work on kids. They don't have anything. They're like blackboards that have been erased, but they only have a couple of marks on it. They don't have anything. They don't have anything to work with. They're still stupid. I don't mean stupid like, I mean ignorant. That's what I mean. I don't mean stupid. Stupid is slow to apprehend. They're not slow to apprehend. They're quick to apprehend, but they're ignorant. They don't have a lot of material. They haven't gathered a lot of material. Now, that doesn't mean they don't think they have. They think they know a lot of stuff. They think they've gathered a lot of material, but they haven't gathered a lot of material. Because they haven't gathered a lot of material, there's not much for this work to work on. The fourth way lies in life. You've got to know about life, what's going on, taking impressions from all sides of life. I know about politics. I did a lot of time in politics. I ran for mayor of this city. I have a rich political background. I know about politics. I don't get involved in politics now, but that's because I know about politics. That's why I don't get involved in politics now. 
But that doesn't mean because I don't get involved that I don't know about it. I learned about it before. I learned about working in a canning company in Florida and canning citrus fruits and juices. I learned about that. I learned about labeling machines. I learned about how to work with people. I learned about how to drive a forklift. I learned about how to stack pallets. I learned about how to pack crates. I learned about how to pack box cars. I learned about that stuff. So I don't do that anymore, but I know about that stuff. So there are a lot of things that you do in life just to take in the impressions, just to get the experience, because it gives the work something to work with, because we've got to know about life. Ignorance is a curse. Very ignorant people can't meet the fourth way. If they do, accidentally, they can't understand what it's about. What they do is they take it and they make something absurd out of it. People really do. Oh, we've got to do things different. There were people in England during the 40s who they get these work ideas and they do absurd things like eat coal. Ah, eat coal, you know, take a bit of coal and chew it, chew it up. Oh, this is, I'm not being mechanical. I'm doing this consciously. I'm serious. I'm serious. Just do crazy things like that. And that's what I mean by people who are ignorant. The work doesn't have anything to fall on in them. And so they can't do anything with it. They can't, they just, so they just make up silly things and it becomes absurd. So you've got to have that. Ignorance really is a curse. A man must be in life and know about life before he can see what teaching is about, or he'll take it all for granted as if it were life. What I mean is, you got to be in life, you got to know about life, you got to be a good householder. You got to be able to move in life. You got to be able to move in business circles. You got to be able to move in social circles. You got to be able to find your way around the block. You got to be able to find your way around town. You got to be a good householder. You got to be somebody who people look at and they go, the guy's got it together. He's got it together. Well, maybe not everything, but he's got it together. That's a good householder. Anybody in life looks at a good household, they go, he's a good guy. He's a citizen. You've got to have that at least. If you're like on skid row, forget about it. This work is not for you. You've got a lot of other things to do first before you can do this work. When I say this work is not for everybody, I mean it. It's for select people. It's for people who have selected themselves, who have chosen to be good householders. Kids don't know about life. There are a lot of old people that don't know about life either. They have no material with which to work. They have no material with which the work may struggle. This work is about struggle. This work is about struggling with life. It's a wrestling match with life. And you've got to get enough work in you, enough work ideas in you, and enough life ideas in you in order to have a good war. Otherwise, you've got nothing going. Without struggle, the work has no power to act on you, and it goes straight to false personality. What does it mean, the work goes straight to false personality? Ah, oh, come on. At first, it increases ambition and self-love, causing people to seek status. Everybody here knows this. When you first were introduced to the work, the first thing you did was try to be the best at it, try to know all the answers, try to have all the right answers and have the right formulas so that whenever the questions were asked, you had the right answer, so that you were better than anybody else and that proved you were doing the work. And what did it really prove? Proved you wanted preeminent. It proved your pride and vanity were running you. It proved you were an egomaniac. Not that we needed proof, <laughs> but it proved it. That's what it proves. So at first, it falls on false personality. With magnetic center, a separation begins between false personality and eyes that wish to work. At that point, the work has begun to act on a person. If a person already has magnetic center when they come into this, then the work falls on false personality. Because where else can it fall? It falls on false personality, but they know what to do with it. They've got something inside them, and they, they have a sense of what to do with it. At that point, if the person's earned the possibility of interchange, eyes that lie become more and more observable. We all have eyes that lie. In fact, there are very few that ever don't lie. The eyes inside of us are liars. It's what they do. They lie about everything, whether they need to lie about it or not. And if you have earned the possibility of interchange, what that means is, through a series of events in this life, and who knows, lives before, a lot of people like to say, recurrences, you earn the right to have a possibility to have interchange. There's some people you've got to admit, you've met people, they have no possibility of interchange. There's no possibility. It's not going to happen in this lifetime. You look at them and you know, forget it, it's not going to happen. How do you know? They're in a mental institution or they're in a drug rehab center for the 18th time and they're uh, dying. They're on death row. Then you, that's it. They're not going to make it. They're not going to, they have no possibility of interchange. This life wasn't it for them. They didn't get that, period. They did not earn the right to have that. You have to earn the right. It just doesn't just fall on your lap. You have earned the right to be here. <laughs> That's why it's so comical to me to watch someone throw it out the window so easily. I think, yo, then you realize they didn't earn the right to be here. The great process of inner separation begins. Personality becomes more passive and the essential side begins to develop. The essential part of you 
came here, who you really are, before false personality was acquired, before you surrounded yourself with this huge mask, with this huge pretense with which you would deal with life, before you found out that kids at school were cruel and you had to have certain faces and masks to wear with each different group and you had to keep those separate. So that with the bad kids, with the jocks, you did this, and with the nerds, you did that, and with the druggies, you did this. So you developed these different facets of your personality. You acquired that in order to survive school or survive your family. Look at the personalities you had to develop to survive your mother and your father, who were both totally different. You had to be one person with your mother, another person with your father, another person with your brother, another person with your sister, because that's what it takes to survive, and that's what false personality is about. It's about acquiring all of these masks, pretenses, strategies, policies, habits, in order to survive. So the essential you gets lost in all of that. But when that false personality that we have acquired becomes more passive, then the essential side of us begins to develop. It begins to grow and unfold the way it was supposed to. But it first had to be encased in this false personality so that it could survive a very difficult time. It's like when they send up a shuttle into space. They leave a lot of junk. The shuttle is just like this thing, this just this kind of like this airplane on all this big rocket junk. And all the rocket junk is gone, and then the shuttle's up there. Well, what about all that other stuff? Well, that's all gone. It's not needed anymore. They don't take that with them because it's just excess baggage now. That fuel spent, they jettison it. It's gone. All it was was containers for fuel. Containers for fuel and rocket power, but mostly containers for fuel. Very little rocket power, really. Most of it is fuel. That's where most of the weight comes from. So they get rid of all that stuff, and all that's spent, they just get rid of it. They don't take it with them. That's the way false personality is. You start to get rid of it. You start to jettison that stuff. You use the fuel. False personality is a lot of fuel. You use all you can use, and then you get rid of it. You start to make it passive, so that the real part of you can begin to grow and develop. It brings insights, mental and emotional perceptions that gradually pass towards the realization of influences of higher centers. The essential part of you, the real part of you, brings insights and emotions and thoughts that you cannot imagine now, or you have glimpses of, flashes of, where you know something beyond this madness, beyond what this world has given. And it's inexplicable, but you still know, and you know you know, and nobody can convince you otherwise, and no one should. As long as we take ourselves as one, all of this is impossible. The doctrine of eyes is important because until we can realize that we are not one, that we are many, that there are many eyes living inside of us, that we are incredibly fragmented, and that we need to begin to observe them in order to get control over them, that we need to become aware of them and categorize them and study them and know what this machine is doing. It's a machine out of control. And a machine out of control is never going to get us to the point where we can come under the influence of higher centers and lift ourselves out of this mechanical, little, myopic life. And that's what we're talking about.